Please open your Bibles to the book of Amos, chapter 6. Your Schofield Reference Bible, page 938. Amos, chapter 6, beginning with the first verse, we'll read through verse 7. And the third verse is the text verse for this morning's message. And let's stand, please, as we always do for the reading of the Word of God. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion, and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations, to whom the house of Israel came. Pass ye into Calme, and see, and from thence go ye to Hamath, the great then go down to the Gath of the Philistines, be they better than these kingdoms, or their border greater than your border, ye that put far away the evil day, and cause the seed of violence to come near, that lie upon beds of ivory, and stretch themselves upon their couches, and eat the lambs out of the flock, and the calves out of the midst of the stall, that chant to the sound of the viol and invent to themselves instruments of music like David, that drink wine in bowls, and anoint themselves with the chief ointments, but they are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. And let's finish together on the seventh verse, please. Therefore now shall they go captive with the first that go captive, and the banquet of them that stretch themselves shall be removed. And let's pray. Father, we're so glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you for our preacher. We pray for thy blessing and power and thy spirit to rest upon him in a way that would bring us that which we need from thee. We thank you for your word. How truly grateful we are for a church who through its history has honored thy word. And now we would honor thee by obeying thy word. In Jesus' name, amen. I could not help but think, and I do this every time Brother and Ms. Wendell can are here, they make an annual journey here, and I could not help but remember, think of the memories that must be in his, in their minds. You see, there was a day, it's been many years ago now, when Highland Park Baptist Church of Chattanooga, Tennessee, was the first Baptist church of Hammond of that generation. They, as are we, were the largest Sunday school in America at one time, I understand. And they, as are we, the main headquarters for the old-time religion and Bible Baptist fundamentalism. And I could not help but think that one of these days, before too many years had passed, Brother Colston, no doubt, is sitting somewhere in an audience with memories of today that we have shared as a church. Brother Colston, because he is so much like Brother Walter Wendelkin. Because of that, <clears throat> I I want us to realize where we're living and what's going on here. Much of my life, I'm giving not just to you now, but I'm doing the best I can <clears throat> to prepare for you when I'm, long, I'm no longer here. You see, as I often say, I happen to love you. I love these young people, I love young couples and young children. I don't want everything to fall apart when I'm gone. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm much of my life, <clears throat> I'm giving to providing an institution here or institutions here that can be perpetuated through these many years to come. Such is the case, my sermon this morning. I'm going to read my text. Let me have, it's we're late this morning. I promise you will not be, we'll be gone. I'll be finished preaching by 12.10, I think sooner than that. And we'll be gone before 12.30, as is always the case. My text is this. Ye that put far away the evil day. Let me paraphrase that. <clears throat> you who think bad times will not come to you. You that avoid the thought that it could ever happen to you. 
I hope you'll listen very carefully. This is a very, very pastoral kind of a sermon today, and I hope you'll listen carefully. Father, I want to be a blessing today. But I want to be a blessing that today is after I'm not here. I want to be a blessing 30 years from now, 20 years from now, 40 years from now. And I pray this morning <clears throat> you'll help me to succeed in my effort to be so. Amen. Set up straight. Um, so straight, listen very carefully as I bring a very pastoral kind of a message. I have prepared <clears throat> for Mrs. Hiles in case of my death. Mrs. Hiles will not starve. I have seen to it. I wish she, she will not be living, live the same lifestyle that she lives now. But she will not starve. I prepared for that. We have here in our church a key man life insurance policy on me. If I pass away today or any time, then the church will receive a sizable a uh, monetary uh, insurance settlement. I'm saying I have prepared for my death. I have prepared for my senior years. As I mentioned a while ago, the Social Security, uh, this is House and I, I've been paying on it, we have for years, and, and then not only that, for <clears throat> many years I have had been paying on a small retirement plan in case that I'm unable to continue preaching. And of course the church is so gracious to have added to that during our 40th anniversary celebration. But even if the church had not done that, I have prepared for our senior years. Not we couldn't take the vacations we're taking now or drive the car we drive the car we drive now, but <clears throat> I have prepared for our senior years. I have prepared for our illness. We have our hospital health plan. This is how now also our own Medicare. I have prepared in case of a car accident. We have comprehensive insurance <clears throat> in our car. We also have liability insurance that we take out in case of a car accident. I have prepared for the possibility of a fire in our condominium where we now live. I have fire insurance in case the condominium is destroyed by fire or damaged by fire. <clears throat> I have prepared for burglary or theft. We have a homeowner's policy that would take care of that. I have prepared in case I'm killed in a plane crash. I have a $100,000 life insurance on my life in case I'm killed in an accident, either any kind of vehicular <coughs> accident. I have prepared for, in case Mrs. Howes and I, the one uh, contact cancer. I have a policy that will take care of our expenses in case we have cancer. And such is the case with many of you. Numbers of you, no doubt, have all the, the uh, protection that I have, <coughs> and you prepared as I have, and others of you, have to some extent by life insurance, health insurance, accident insurance, and homeowners policies and so forth, you have prepared for these uh, emergencies or such circumstances. This morning, I want to speak of a preparation that most people never make. It deals with something that will happen to you. You may not ever need your hospitalization insurance, you may never need your fire insurance. I trust you will not. You may never need your insurance for burglary or your homeowner's policy. You may not live to receive your retirement policy, or you may decide not to retire. You may not ever need your, to cash in on your theft insurance or your cancer insurance, but there is a, a preparation that you ought to make that you will need, and this is it. You will have grief. You will have grief. I will speak this morning in preparation for that grief. 
It may not. It may be that you will not ever need your hospitalization or your fire insurance or your burglary insurance. But I promise you this, ladies and gentlemen, everybody in this room, one of these days, is going to have grief. It will one day be your wife that has cancer. Or your husband will have a heart attack. Or one day your child will break your heart. It won't be somebody else in the announcements made in church will all of a sudden pertain to you. One day your father will pass away. One day your health will fail. One day your child will be handicapped. One day your mother will be taken to heaven. One day your test will be positive. One day your child will be stillborn. One day your loved one will be in the serious accident. One day it is you who is attacked and betrayed. Now you listen to me. I don't understand why it is we don't have grief insurance. I'd like to talk to you about this, this, this necessary thing that is going to come in your life. It usually happens unannounced. The phone rings and the message of grief is given. Uh, the letter is taken from the mailbox and heartache is caused. A pain appears that suddenly uh, causes discomfort. Or the clashing of two cars on the roadway. Or a sudden fall. I was reading the paper one morning in a little country church parsonage in East Texas. Just reading the paper. The phone rang. My father was taken with a heart attack and died. Now, one of these days, it'll be your fault. I was in a motel in Minnesota over a year ago, and you've heard me often speak of this, called Mrs. Hiles. And all of a sudden, found that our little grandson, five years old, was killed, run over by his mother as, she had, as the child had fallen out the back seat of the car in their own driveway. I was preparing to preach in Nederland, Texas. The phone rang. Five minutes before I left, and one of the one of the heartbreaks of my life was given. I had a back pain, no thought of a heart condition, not at all. Just had a back problem. I went to Mill Clinic and sat down there. The doctor gave me the results of the test and shocked me to death when he said, "You have a heart problem." The Bible places a woe on you who are not prepared for grief. In our text a while ago, in Amos chapter 6 and verse 3, a woe was given to people that said, uh, it's way out yonder for me. No, it's as near as the next ring of the telephone. The heartache, the grief, if you please. The Bible places a woe on those who put far away the evil day. It won't happen to me, <laughs> he say, but it will happen to you. I wish it wouldn't. I don't want any of you to suffer, but you mark it down. You one day are going to face grief. But here's the sad thing about it. Most people are not ready for it. You're ready for retirement. You're ready for illness. You're ready for your, uh, in case of your death, to provide for your wife and your family. But most people have made no preparation for the inevitability of grief that's going to come your way. This morning, I'd like to help you prepare you for it. Number one, have your own armor. Have your own armor. Ephesians 6.13 says, Therefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand in the evil day. Now, it didn't say, if the evil day comes. It says, take on the whole armor of God. For example, truth, and salvation, and prayer, and righteousness, and Bible study, and faith. Put these on, because one day, the evil day is going to come. And if you don't crack up and fall apart and fall to pieces in the evil day, it's because you have prepared for it. So I'm trying to say, be sure that you're saved. Be sure your faith is in God. Be sure you spend time on your knees in prayer. Be sure you live in the Bible. Be sure you have a righteous life, because one day you're going to need God's help in the evil day. Listen to me carefully. You're not going to have me always. You're not going to have me standing here Sunday after Sunday trying to encourage you, listen to me now, and give you strength. Some of you are going to have to get weaned. And some of you are going to have to have your own Bible study. 
And some of you are going to have to spend time alone yourself in God's blessed book. Some of you are going to have to walk with God. You, the day is going to come and you can't pick up the phone and call and say, Brother House, hey, Brother House, pray for me. We're having surgery tomorrow. I'm simply saying, uh, you better get your own prayer life and your own altar and your own Bible study and your own walk with God because one day the evil day is going to come and you need to be able to withstand in the evil day. It's an old story. I grew up across the street from the church. Many of you folks have seen the apartment where we lived across the street from my church. My pastor was J.C. Sizemore. He was as real to me as I am to many of you. I needed him like many of you feel that you need me. If I had a problem, ran across the street, knocked on his door, I was the I was probably the closest young person in the church to my preacher. I preached a revival in my home church after I became a pastor. I survived the pulpit on several occasions on a Sunday in my home church, a pretty good-sized church for those days. This house and I became our, our, our own church. I was pastor in East Texas, a little small church, same building that's out there on the campus now, Range Hall Baptist Church. One day my heart was crushed, and I'm not going to it. My heart was crushed. Ms. Howell said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to talk to my pastor. And Mrs. Howell shocked me when she said, you have no pastor. I can hear those words now. You have no pastor. I would have given every dime I own for a pastor 14 months ago when the doctor told me I had heart trouble. i have given every dime I own for a pastor 14 months ago when your little grandson was suddenly killed. Now with these Many long years, 52 years, I've had no pastor. I went out in the backyard, a little pine thicket behind our little parsonage. I got my Bible and knelt out there in the pine thicket beside a little bench. And I said, dear God, I guess I'll never have a pastor. I picked up the old King James Bible. And I said, you will have to be my pastor from now on. Let me tell you what a wonderful pastor I've had. You know, like the two tribes of Israel, when they got in the promised land, they were on one side of the Jordan, and the other twelve tribes on the other side, or twelve and a half tribes, I'm sorry, ten and a half tribes on the other side. And these two tribes built an altar of their own, away from the altar on the other side. And they asked them, why did you do it? And they said, just in case that you are not faithful to what we've been taught, over here, we're going to have our altar over here. And it just may be the day is going to come when you won't have a pastor. Or you may have a liberal pastor. And you may have a hard time finding. Or you may be a pastor yourself. I'm trying to say, get yourself your own walk with God. So in the evil day, you'll be able to withstand. You can I forget that day. When I was preaching in Amarillo, Texas, my pastor had long since retired. At the time, he was about 90 years of age. I couldn't wait to get there because I wanted to see him. I got a cab in the afternoon, and they took me over to my pastor where he lived. He's with Annie, a little short man. And uh, they said he was out at the church where his son pastored. I went down there, and my pastor was there. He didn't know who I was. I said, Brother well, Sasbo, I'm Jack Hiles. He said, Where are you where are you from? He went to use the washroom and he couldn't find his way back to the son's office. I thank God I had my own altar. I thank God I had my own walk with God. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't understand people who who have every kind of insurance under the sun in case something happens, but heartbreak is going to come your way, and heartache is going to come your way, and tragedy is going to come your way. In God's name, live in this book and get yourself girded for it, because the evil day is going to come. Have your own prayer life, your own Bible study, your own walk with God. For one day you won't have me, and one day you won't, you may be the pastor, or one day you may be an older person and have a 
Pastor, not nearly as seasoned as you are and has not been through the trials that you have. I'm trying to say, I'm not trying to build a church here built around this man right here. I'm trying to build a church built around that man up there. Have your own walk with God, your own prayer life, your own living in this book, and have your own altar. There's insurance for the inevitability of grief that's going to come. And then, of course, there was the day when the phone rang and my pastor's daughter-in-law said, for the size more, went to heaven. For the size more, went to heaven. Let me have... Let me testify. I thank God as a young person I learned to walk with God on my own. I thank God that I built my own altar. I thank God I had my own Bible time, my own prayer time. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to have a little lean to on me so you can get strength from me. But brother, make your great strength come from God Almighty Himself. You heard this story. You heard it over and over again. Pat the Irishman. Was reading his Bible. The priest came by to see him and said, Pat, you're not supposed to read your Bible. Well, Pat said, Father, said, I, I read in the Bible where you're supposed to desire the sincere milk of the Word. No, but, but the priest said, Pat, you're supposed to let me tell you what's in the Bible. You, know, you can't understand the Bible for yourself. Uh, let me tell you. But he said, I saw it in the Bible. It said, desire the sincere milk of the Word. I'm just drinking the milk. And the f- priest said, but, but Pat, look, I'm the milkman. I bring you the milk. And Pat said, I've been drinking that diluted milk a long time and decided to get my own cow. Get your own cow. The sincere milk of this eternal, never dying word of God. Word of God. I'm talking about grief insurance. I'm talking about when the time comes. Let me tell you something, folks. For 52 years, no pastor. But I want to thank God as a 17-year-old lad when I was in, East, in, 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 in Texas. I want to thank God that night after night I walked around the block. And night after night I read that book, Neath the Light of a Street Light. And night after night I walked with God and I talked with God. I've had a heap of things in my life. I've had the sad, sadness like you've had. I've had heartbreak like you've had. I've faced, uh, I've faced uh, loss of loved ones like you have. My heart has been broken in almost any way that your heart's been broken. But let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. You don't have to go to somebody else. You can go straight to God for yourself. My little mother came to the office one day years ago to see me. She came by the switchboard and Switchboard operator said, Ms. Hiles, can I help you? She said, No, I want to see Jack. She said, But wait a minute, I'll have to check and see if he can see you. My little mother said, He can see me. <laughs> then she went by my secretary's office. I think Sandy Proper is my secretary in those days. Went by her office, and Sandy said, Ms. Hiles, can I help you? And she said, Uh, uh, no. Well, she said, well, what, what are you here for? She said, I'm going to see Jack. And she said, you need my help? I'll check and see if he can see you. She said, he can see me. She just walked right by the secretary's door, right by the switchboard door, right by my secretary's door, walked in and said, hi, son. And I have that same access to God, and so do you. That man across the street over there doesn't have any more access to God than the humblest Christian this room has. Now, since you have it, take advantage of it. I'm talking about grief insurance. Now, let me pivot. The second thing, not only the arm of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Second thing, remember. Please ask these 12 on. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. While the evil days come not. Before the evil days come, just as you put on the whole armor of God to withstand in the evil days, likewise, you remember your Creator. So you can take it in the evil days. I'm talking about the great days. I'm talking about the days of heartache. This house and I were saying just the other day, every day, every day, our hearts are broken because of somebody. And by the way, you don't know what's going to hit you. People call and say, 
pray for so-and-so, or pray for me, or pray for my husband. Oh, I got a phone call today. You don't know when it's going to hit you, so go get God live in this book, and don't forget, remember. Now, you can't remember what you don't hear. And you can't remember what you haven't stored in this computer up here. Let me tell you something. One of the best ways you'll ever be able to withstand and take it when the tough time comes and the best grief insurance you'll have is sit up and listen to every word that's said from this pulpit. Every word. Young people, teenagers, you're just a few days from having a child that's born afflicted or a stillborn baby. Or you're a few days from some husband leaving you running off with a whore. You're just a few days from life's realities. Set up and listen while this preacher is preaching. And get some brief insurance and strength. Listen to every word that's said. That isn't all. Don't miss the service. And if you do miss the service, get the tape. And then read all of my books. I want you to hear me very carefully for a minute. I can't get to all of you. And the day is going to come when you won't have me to get to. Now, I'm going to tell you this morning how you'll never need marital counseling again. Listen to me. How you'll never need marital counseling again. I have a book I wrote. You'll come to me for marital counseling and you've not read one chapter of this book. Now, one thing you ought to do, every married person here ought to read this book once a year. I'm trying to tell you that I'm going to tell you the same thing in my office that, I'm, uh, that, 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 that you get in this book. Get in the book, and, and that isn't all. I've got a whole set of cassettes on marriage. I taught them here all Wednesday night. Whole set right here. Listen to them. I said, get them and listen to them. You wait till your marriage is falling apart. Bless God, your marriage won't fall apart if you read the book and listen to tapes. Take out some insurance. I can show you how not to need child rearing counseling. You don't understand me now. You don't read the book. You don't listen to tapes. You come to my office, your marriage on the rocks, I'm going to see you. And I'm going to try to help you. But the day's going to come and I won't be here to help you. The day's going to come when I can't see everybody with the day that you need to be seen. I'm trying to tell you what you ought to do is you ought to practically memorize that book on marriage. And you ought to, you ought to practically memorize what's in these tapes on marriage. And I'll promise you, ladies and gentlemen, if you want your marriage to be happy, if you'll read that book right there and listen to those tapes right there, you will have a happy marriage if you'll do what it says. I'll show you how you can never need counseling but how to affect your children again. How long has it been since you read How to Rear Teenagers? You parents of teenagers, how long has it been since you read this book? I'm not mad at you. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, it's time that we got back to preparing so you'll know what to do when the tough time comes. Instead of rushing and have the fire department come, put out a fire that's already blazing. Every parent here today who has a teenager or someone near teenage years will read that. But be, Brother Ray Young, he's out here this morning. He's home watching a movie. But Brother Ray Young, every day of his life, he reads at least one chapter of some book that I've written. You say you think your books have the answers? Well, I wouldn't have written if I didn't think they have the answers. But I'll tell you one thing. You folks that have teenagers, oh, you've come, oh, I can't have a teenager. Well, here it is. I have some tapes, for example, on the parent-teen relationship. I talked two hours here one night to all of the parents of our teen, uh, parents of teenagers and taped that 
How long has it been since you listened to that parent-teen relationship? Look, I'm not mad at you. I love you, and I want you when the, when the time of grief comes to know what to do. But the truth is, you know, you're blowing, you're blowing you. Uh, Dr. Streeter back there. My soul. He studied for four months to become a doctor. Not much, but he studied some. No, year after year, I was his pastor. Year after year. His brother, Dr. Dennis Peter, I was his pastor. Year after year after year after year after year after year. Same is true with the dentist. Even nurses. And yet the most important job a woman can fill in this whole world is that of being a wife. And you'll get married, won't read one little old book on how to be a wife. You spend more time reading some books and finding out how to be a good wife and less time picking out the flowers and all the dresses. And I'm not against that. I am against spending more time picking out the dresses than preparing yourself to be a wife. It's going to come. How long has it been since you parents have... Beginners and primaries and junior kids, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years of age, since you read How to Read Children. Oh, you have a trouble with your child, you'll come to see me, and I'll see you. But we can say both of us time if you'll read the book. And I'm not against seeing you. I want to see you. I happen to love you. And I want to help you. And if you never read a single thing I've written or hear one single tape that I have made, and come to me for help, I'll give all I can. I'll give it all I've got. If you don't believe it, you ask the couples I'm counseling right now. I labor and travail to save their marriages. And I'm going to say a word about that in a few weeks on Wednesday night. But I labor and travail to save your marriages and to help you rear your kids. But one way I'm trying to help you is I put it in print and put it on tape so you can prepare for the inevitable tragedy and heartache. I'm talking about grief insurance. I'm talking about preparing for the inevitable. Preparing for hospitalization is not inevitable. Being sick is not inevitable. Preparing for a car, car wreck is not inevitable. Preparing for, for retirement is not inevitable. But pain, grief, heartache, and sorrow is inevitable. It's going to come. I'll tell you what I'd do also. I'd keep a library of tapes. Every time I heard a sermon that would prepare me for grief in the future, I'd get that tape and I'd put it in the pantry and the tapes. And when you need it, pull it out. You can hear my voice 25 years from now when I'm in heaven praising God with the angels. You can hear my voice preach to you. But get those tapes and you find one and you say, I may need that someday. Get it and store it. Dr. Lindifin, I'm just a little bit older right now than Dr. Robertson was when he walked out of Highland Park Baptist Church. I've seen pictures of Ms. Robertson, Dr. Robertson, walking out the center aisle for the last time after being there over 40 years. And that tears my soul out. I want you to be happy. I want you to be able to face the inevitable grief that's coming. I want to help you after my voice is quiet and still. I beg you, I plead with you, Take out grief insurance. Number three, not only remember in the days of thy youth, the evil days come not. Not only take up the whole armor of God, which may be able to stand in the evil day. But Ephesians 5.16 says, Redeem the, redeeming the time for the days are evil. Redeeming the time. Why? The days are evil. The evil day is going to come. So while you've got strength, serve God with all your strength you've got. Suppose today somebody walks out tonight and says, Preacher had a stroke this afternoon. He's paralyzed. Can't talk. Suppose that my little heart condition flared up this afternoon, and this is the last sermon I preach. I've, I've, I've used my time. I have no regrets. I've worked hard. 
I've left books and tapes and pastors across America, missionaries around the world, the college and the high, high school and grade schools and junior high schools to train your children. I'm saying I've redeemed the time. I've used it. I've worked. You have some of you folks spend more time playing than working. Your idea about life is fun and playing and games. Life is more than that. When the evil days come and the tragedies come, you want to say the days when I was strong, I used the wisely serving God. Redeem the time. Redeem the time. For the days are your. I have no premonition. My plans are to be standing behind this book for ten years from now. But I, if I am here ten years from now, I want you to be happy eleven years from now. And 20 years from now. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. Why in the world you spend more time reading this book? You've got a baby on the way and haven't even read this book on how to read infants yet. I don't understand that. I don't understand why. You spend more time watching television than you do in the Bible. I don't understand that. I can't comprehend that. I promise you this. When the evil days come, Oprah's not going to come make a call on you. I promise you this, Jerry Springer, 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 whatever the guy's name is, I promise you, you won't call him and say, pray for me, and you won't call Gus the bartender and say, pray for me, and you won't call Sammy Sosa and say, pray for me, he needs prayer himself. I'm trying to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the evil day is going to come. I'm saying, put on your whole armor of God, and remember now, you're created on the days of your youth, when the evil days draw nigh, and redeem the time for the day. Are evil. Would you bow your heads, please?